and following of evidence of Russian war crimes in Ukraine, especially against civilians, women and children. And today, together with our, our estimated panelists, Людмила Денисова, Ukrainian representative. Людмила Денисова, you. Also Mr. Kenneth Wrights, who is lawyer and also executive director of Human Rights Watch. We will discuss what should we do to stop this, uh, this war, what should we do to defend human rights in Ukraine. I'm very happy to introduce to you, uh, to us, our panelists, and my first questions will be to Lyudmila. Lyudmila, could you please say us what is really happening now in Ukraine? Because you are dealing with this each day, and you really know each Russian war crimes what is now done in Ukraine. Що відбувається в нашій країні? В нашій країні In our country we have a very cruel war going on. Russian machineries are destroying, eliminating our country, eliminating our people. Do you understand? People always ask how many victims are there now? Uh, how many people uh, perished, now it is impossible to say, to calculate it. We are sitting here now in such a nice place with the good uh, weather and we are in good mood almost. So many people are walking along the streets, but now our citizens are being shot. They are bombarding using unconventional weapons. They are using cassette bombs. Uh, uh, missiles, different types of mi missiles. That is the, these are the weapons that are striking awful, uh, awfully. And the number of losses when our cities and towns are bombarded is impossible to comp calculate. It will be possible to do so after we liberate all the cities and towns, after we uh, uh, put away all these debris, debris. But the main thing is not to calculate the victims, but to prevent so that in the future we don't have it. So again, in 90 days, there's no repetition of that. And that is why myself and my office, we work 24 hours, seven days a week. We have a hotline and our citizens call, and there are more than 44,000 of those who called us. We registered crimes against uh, 87,000 people. We have the hotline uh, where we provide psychological assistance. Uh, uh, psychological help is provided to people who call us and who need such help. You understand? Our, when our psychologists uh, hear these awful tragedies and such people who talk about that, they want to commit suicides. Our psychologists, uh, it's very difficult for them, but they do a very important and uh, difficult work. And some of our citizens are brave enough to give us the opportunity to talk about their tragedies. Do you understand that? That opens up a little bit the tactic of war uh, by Russians. And they systemically, everywhere, with the awful cruelty, they are raping and they commit other sexual uh, violence and uh, they kill our people. And that is a separate weapon of Russian Federation. And we need to talk about that because we need to stop raping of our children, of our women. Why are they doing it? They're doing it so that we, our women, never have a chance to give birth to children or so that they don't want to do that. That means that it is a genocide of Ukrainian people because there are no children, no nation, no country. And it is very important that the world understands it, that the world is impossible because 
uh, it's impossible to just negotiate with Putin so that he stops shelling and bombarding. And that's not the peace that our country, our guys, our armed forces are looking for. And they are doing everything so that you can have a morning coffee at home. And this is our life. And one more thing I would like to mention here and draw your attention to, we have uh, a big, big uh, issue when our people leave their homes. Yes, there are more than six million who left our country. I thank all the countries, all the peoples of these countries that they gave refuge to our citizens. Eight million uh, left uh, uh, the dangerous or uh, territories where it's dangerous, but we still have one million four hundred thousand which were deported forcefully by Russian Federation to the territory of the Russian Federation. And when they say, well, that's a fake, maybe they themselves went there, it's like a tourism. No, my dear. I have convincing evidence, and I can demonstrate to you that Russian Federation, in advance, was preparing this forceful deportation. It was uh, planned for two million of our citizens. I have directives that were issued by the leadership to certain bodies to set up the temporary points of uh, placement of our uh, citizens. And we know where they are and in which conditions they are. And uh, we also thank uh, the uh, Russians who are volunteers, who are raising money and who give this money and clothes and food and they provide support uh, uh, to our citizens. We know about that. We know where they are. And uh, this should be resolved at the international uh, uh, level so that our citizens are returned to our country because Russian authorities, they are putting our children to Russian schools. I have textbooks and recommendations for teachers how they should do it. Uh, they teach in Russian language, and that means that they destroy, eliminate the national identity of people. Uh, that is uh, the sign of genocide of our people. And every day we need to talk about that so that Ukraine be stays an independent country within the borders recognized by the international community. We request you, each one, to remember about that. If we do not fight for the freedom for ourselves, freedom for you, thanks to the weapons which you provide and thanks to the sanctions, then they will come to you. I don't want this to happen. Thank you. Thank you Ludmilo за те, що ділитеся з нами такими доказами і з нашими гостями. Ви працюєте more than 20 years and you have experience with uh, war crimes all over the world. Could you please share your expertise on this internationally and especially on Ukraine because I know that Human Rights Watch has published recently a report on what's going on in Ukraine. Um, yes, well, let me just begin by saying how pleased I am to be here. I love the idea of Russian war crimes house. You know, whoever had that brilliant idea, I congratulate them. Um, but it's a very appropriate renaming of this institution here in Davos. Um, now, Human Rights Watch, as, as you noted, has had um, teams on the ground in Ukraine throughout the war and indeed, you know, since 2014 and be before. Um, so what we do is we try to kind of provide an in-depth analysis as to whether um, the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law is violated or not. You know, were war crimes committed or not? And it's, it's important to do that because if you just see a body on the ground, you know, that's a tragedy, but it's not necessarily a war crime. You have to ask, you know, was this person executed or, or were they, you know, indiscriminately shelled? Or was it just the unfortunate consequence of you know, the targeting of a, a military facility? And so you really have to go on the ground, interview 
the survivors, the eyewitnesses, we take photographs. We have separate teams who are collecting so-called open source materials, so anything posted on social media, we download and analyze. We have a partnership with a satellite imagery company, so we can get, um, it takes a picture of every place in the world every single day. And so it's like a time machine. You can you know, say, well, what happened here over the last five or 10 days? And we can look day by day by day and figure out what happened. So we, a lot of work goes into analyzing, you know, was this a war crime or not? Now, let me just take, say a word about you know, the term war crime. Um, because international humanitarian law is, is quite specific. It says you cannot target a civilian. You have to only focus on military targets. You cannot fire indiscriminately. You've got to aim at the military target, not just bomb an entire neighborhood. Um, even if you are aiming at a military target, you have to take all feasible precautions to spare civilians. Mm -hmm. So that involves you know, the type of weaponry you use, um, the time of day, things of that sort. Because the whole aim of the Geneva Conventions is to minimize the harm to civilians. Now, what we've seen in Ukraine is frankly not that different from what we saw in Chechnya and what we saw in Syria. Um, this is the way that the Russian military operates when it faces significant military resistance. It doesn't just target the other side's military as humanitarian law requires. It tries to harm civilians. It, it proceeds under the theory known as total war where, you know, in this case, Ukrainian civilians are treated as fair game. Now, that's a blatant war crime. That is completely illegal. That is the strategy that the Kremlin is pursuing. And my teams in Ukraine have documented many examples of these war crimes. We have had teams, you know, throughout the villages and towns north of Kyiv, north of Chernihiv, and have seen time after time summary executions, um, the detention and torture of people, the holding of them in inhumane circumstances. We've, um, we have not been into Mariupol, but we have spoken with many people who have fled Mariupol and have reported there on the indiscriminate bombardment, you know, similar to what has been happening in, say, um, Kharkiv, but also the refusal to allow humanitarian aid in, the refusal to allow humanitarian evacuations of civilians, the forcing of civilians into Russia, as you were mentioning, you know, through these filtration camps, which is you know, kind of a euphemism for you know, often torture centers and certainly harsh interrogation, where people who fail the interrogation, it's unclear what happens to them, but you know, we're obviously very worried about more executions, certainly about torture in the course of these interrogations. So we have been you know, trying to look at the range of war crimes being committed. And we're doing it you know, not just describing in broad terms what's happening, but we're trying to do it by accumulating evidence. And we want that evidence, you know, ultimately, so that the perpetrators can be prosecuted. I mean, not just the, the soldier on the ground, but also the chain of command. And we also, frankly, want to deploy this information. We want the international community to have it, and we want the Russian people to have it. And so that kind of, you know, in essence, is what Human Rights Watch has been up to over the last you know, few months in Ukraine. Uh, many thanks. Uh, can you mention the how and Lyudmila also how it importance it to collect evidence of Russian war crimes? But we understand that to do it during ongoing war is very complicated. Could you please let us know the most uh, important challenges do you have by doing it and how we can as country overcome it? Because we need evidence, so we need to be ready to go to the court. Well, the. I mean, obviously there's security issues, so you know, in the middle of the fighting, it's hard to get there. You know, we, we, we sometimes yeah, will use sure. you know, open source investigation, but you know, as soon as the fighting ends, we try to send people in. I think one of the biggest challenges now is first of all, the professionalization of the evidence collecting process, because many people are going in there who are not necessarily trained and who may actually be disturbing the evidence rather than preserving it. You know, there also is a real problem of coordination because you know, the Ukrainian government is doing a very big effort to collect evidence, but you know, so are various international governments and institutions, and there's not necessarily that much coordination 
among them. Um, and I think we need to do that, you know, both to avoid duplication of efforts, but also to try to assemble as best we can um, the evidence that we collect. Because in the end, I think there's going to be kind of multiple prosecutions. Um, the Ukrainian government will clearly do what it can, you know, particularly as we've seen the last few days, you know, if there are Russian soldiers who are captured and there's evidence against them, they can be prosecuted right there in Ukraine. Um, so that will be, you know, one important avenue. Um, a second will be the International Criminal Court, which will probably focus on the senior most officials. That's, you know, tends to be their mandate. So it's going to try to work the chain of command as high as it can up to the top. And then the third thing that's worth mentioning is prosecutions by national governments, you know, principally in Europe, under what's known as universal jurisdiction. And that's the concept that says, you know, say a, a court in Germany can prosecute a Russian suspect for a war crime in Ukraine. Because a war crime is subject to universal jurisdiction, meaning any competent court, any place in the world can prosecute that person. And so I think that we're going to see, you know, national courts using universal jurisdiction as an important supplement to both Ukrainian and the international criminal courts efforts. Many sense. Uh, Lyudmila, can you please also comment on collective evidence on Russian war crimes in Ukraine, especially from the side from Ukraine? Uh, I absolutely agree with the colleague that the main thing uh, to uh, basically take to responsibility these uh, persecutors, we need to first of all register of these events and to get a registration by interviews with victims. The mandate of the ombudsman gives me the opportunity, and that's my duty, to work with the victims of the military crimes, of the war crimes. We interview people who, for example, were uh, taken out of Mariupol. Mariupol. We went to the town where they are now. Not all of them wanted to give such evidence because taking into account psychological condition, they Sometimes uh, they do not believe that that is what happened to them, but we managed to interview most uh, people in Zaporizhia, and then when they were moved to Lviv, I have my offices everywhere in different regions, and we interviewed these people. And they registered these war crimes which were committed. For example, we have uh, the evidence of a person who was in this theater when they were bombing it. They were bombing this uh, field uh, kitchen, so to say they managed to get evacuated, but where to? To Azovstal. And then they were in Azovstal, and this person uh, was in Azovstal and also gave evidence about how they were bombarded. How that is one method of registering war crimes, that's interview. Then we have exchanges. Our military uh, exchanged those who were uh, uh, caught prisoners. We interview them and we register all the tortures which were committed against them. Sometimes you just think how this could happen when a person a military person. What about the Geneva Convention about treating uh, uh, war prisoners? I believe in Russian Federation, they don't know about that. And they take uh, these people with a second head uh, all over uh, Russia. And when they interrogate them, they put this sack, they turn on the uh, sore, and they say that will cut off all your limbs. And that is the pressure. These are tortures to get some evidence. And that is important. And we are registering that. And another registration is taking place uh, via a telephone hotline. We have operators who are specially trained how to receive and correctly register the information. For example, uh, I think uh, someone called about uh, 
searching for people who are missing. And that was uh, 20,000 of our citizens who were missing. Uh, we, they sent us the videos, the photographs, and we collect it all, and we started cooperating with the International Criminal Court. And we had this group of investigators together with their leader, and at the time when a month ago they were there, we gave them 27,000 uh, requests. Uh, they saw how we are doing it, how we are registering, and they are happy uh, with what we are doing. And we are ready. And we want a special international tribunal to be created so that these gaps uh, between the mandates of the International Court of the UN and the International Criminal Court are filled in by uh, the functionalities of the special uh, tribunal and so that all these persecutors, uh, and all, all these perpetrators, sorry, all those who committed crimes on our territory, they should receive punishment. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Yudmila and Ken, you both mentioned about the importance of, of evidence of Russian war crimes. And of course, as an important issue is responsibility. And I invite both of you to speak about responsibility. How, what should be done to get Russia to be responsible for all crimes happening in Ukraine? What should be done by Ukrainians and, and internationally? Well, let me, um, I mean, talk from the perspective of the International Criminal Court, because it will um, try to aim as high as it can. Um, you know, the, in a sense, the, the role of other courts, including Ukraine's, will be to, you know, go after the immediate perpetrators. But the International Criminal Court is going to look at the chain of command. And under international law, um, senior officials can be responsible if they either order a war crime or through the concept of so-called command responsibility, if they are aware of war crimes and don't take steps to stop them and punish them. And what we're seeing, if you look you know, all the way to Putin, rather than, you know, it, I mean, when word first got out, you know, oh my goodness, you know, there were executions in Bucha. You know, if, if Putin was serious about upholding the Geneva Conventions, he would have said, that's terrible, that should stop immediately, you know? Obviously, that's not what he did. Um, in fact, he did almost the opposite. He said, that's fake news. You're making that up. Those are lies. It didn't happen. And, and you know, the message from Putin is, um, go ahead, you know, commit war crimes, and we'll cover up for you, you know, which is almost you know, evidence of command responsibility. You know, he's also gone so far, if you look at his behavior, even back in Syria, and I mentioned that you know, what he's doing in Ukraine is the exact same thing that he did in Syria. He would give you know, um, awards to the generals who were overseeing, you know, in, in Syria, it was the bombardment of hospitals and schools and marketplaces and apartment buildings. And then he would give them you know, the, the Hero of Russia award. So again, the message is, you're doing exactly what I want you to do. And this you know, is all gonna be evidence against him. Now, we, Human Rights Watch did a chain of command analysis in Idlib province in northwestern Syria, where Russian jets were bombing civilian institutions over and over and over again. And we looked at 46 cases where this had happened and were able to trace the chain of command up to Putin. Now, we haven't yet done that in the case of Ukraine, but a lot of similar evidence is there. But this is exactly what the International Criminal Court will do because its aim will be to try to charge you know, the most senior officials responsible. And Putin is obviously commander in chief of the Russian armed forces. He so far is giving no indication of trying to stop these war crimes and every indication that that is the military strategy that he wants pursued. Uh, many sense. And actually, recently, uh, the first Russian soldier was pledged guilty in the war crimes trial for killing an unarmed Ukrainian. And from your experience, can such trial be a deterrent and prevent future human rights violations, or it's only one step and it 
actually doesn't mean a lot. No, I actually think it's important because, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you're a, a low-level soldier in the Russian military, you know, there's no evidence at this stage that you're getting instructions to avoid war crimes. You know, the, the ethos seems to be, do what you want, you'll get away with it. You know, and so if, you know, if this recent war crimes trial in Ukraine is a warning. It says, you know, if you get captured and if you have been responsible for war crimes, you can get prosecuted and you get a very serious prison term. Um, and there was just a, um, like the New York Times did an analysis just a few days ago where they um, obtained a video of Russian soldiers marching, I think it was nine men, who basically were you know, executed immediately. And, and they're now you know, trying to use facial recognition software to identify who were those Russian soldiers. And again, that's a warning, you know? This could be you. You know, you think you'll get away with these atrocities, but, but you could be held responsible. So I, I think that's very, very important. Let me just mention one other thing, because you, you referred to it earlier. The, um, obviously, we know that, you know, a thousand or more um, Ukrainian soldiers have just surrendered to Russian forces in Mariupol, um, including members of the Azov Brigade. And these are all prisoners of war. Um, and what that means under the third Geneva Convention is that if you are a member of an opposing armed force in an international armed conflict, your prisoner of war status means you cannot be prosecuted simply for taking up arms. You know, if all that you did was shoot at the military on the other side, that is not a crime with prisoner of war status. If you commit war crimes, you know, if you shoot civilians or the like, if you torture, if you indiscriminately bombard, that is a war crime, you can be prosecuted. But a prisoner of war cannot be prosecuted simply for shooting at the other side. We need to watch what Russia does with these prisoners of war, these people who have been, you know, who have surrendered out of Mariupol. Because um, if they, and if there's evidence that they, they committed war crimes, fine, they can be prosecuted. But if all that they have is that they were soldiers, you know, shooting at Russian forces, that is protected. Um, the Third Geneva Convention says they cannot be prosecuted. And so, you know, I, I worry, I mean, Putin has not paid a lot of attention to the Geneva Conventions. I worry that he may just rip that up, you know, stage a show trial, say, that, oh, look, at these are Nazis and we're just going to get them. And, you know, that there's going to be a show trial, a propaganda effort in violation of the Third Geneva Convention. That hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch has been speaking out against that. But it's something to pay attention to. Many sense. Lyudmila, you told us already about all efforts Ukraine, Ukraine is doing to uh, secure uh, human rights in Ukraine and to evident uh, Russian war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, do you feel that Ukraine have enough international experience or would you prefer to have more international experience from international organization from countries? What is your feeling? Is it worth doing enough to support Ukraine on this very complicated way? You know, uh, such an experience, uh, this is what Ukraine gets for the first time. We had some experience in 2014, 2015, when the world was just uh, uh, concerned, deeply concerned with what was happening. But if then uh, there were the sanctions applied like now, then there would be no 2022. Okay. Putin would have never bombarded Kiev. Uh, uh, maybe he would do something in Donbass, maybe he would do something there. But you understand, uh, there was uh, this deep concern, but the sanctions were such like uh, a bite of a mosquito. So that is why uh, we are gaining the experience and we are working with our law enforcement bodies and if we receive the information from citizens or from uh, uh, others, we uh, give that uh, uh, to law enforcement uh, bodies. But as to international, we cooperate as the institution. We cooperate with the uh, European Court uh, on Human Rights and International uh, 
criminal court, we included, a, there was a lot of uh, materials included into the report as to implementation of Moscow mechanism. There was such a report, and that confirms that we are talking about that there are war crimes and crimes of aggression. When Russian soldiers, they disguise themselves into Ukrainian uniform and they kill our border guards. And that is violation of the rules of war, which are to be followed. And uh, there are many, many things like that. I'm sorry. Uh, could you tell us uh, and share uh, with uh, what's happening in Ukraine? You work with victims. You know about that. Uh, here we have some of the evidence of war crimes. But what you hear from victims, what impresses you most? What impresses most is that they uh, are talking about how Russian soldiers treat them. The first uh, uh, message uh, in my messenger at Facebook, I received a message from a group of girls, and they wrote that there were many of them. Uh, from 14 to 20 in Bucha, they were in basement, they were raped. And out of these 25 girls and uh, women, several were pregnant. And uh, do you understand? Uh, we need to interview them. We need to register that. But at that time, they were not ready to do that. They wanted just to get some psychological support to tell someone about that. And then we started this hotline on psychological support. Now we have psychologists who work there uh, 24 by 7. And uh, uh, most of these phone calls were about uh, suicides. More than 500 suicides were committed. And out of them, 140 are minors. The mothers call at night. For example, when I was on the way here, the head of this group of psychological support told me the mother, one mother of three-year-old boy called at 3.40 in the morning. And she said, and she asked what to do. She wants to commit suicide. The child that they uh, had been looking for, uh, waiting for so long, uh, this three-year-old child was raped, uh, and he just uh, died. That's Alexandrivka of Kherson region. Alexandrivka now turned into Bucha, and they somehow are raping little children. Do you understand when six-month baby girl is raped by a teaspoon on nine months old girl is raped by candle, or one-year-old boy is raped by five uh, orcs and he died. Or the twins who were two year, years old, they also died. And that's again Alexandrivka. In Bucha, we received information from teenagers, from women, from girls. Yes, we gave them uh, the opportunity to recover and uh, explain how to, because if they got pregnant and uh, if they cannot make abortion, what to do. But now it's different. Now there are suicides of parents, what they should do. The tactic is the same of Russian Federation, of using systemically everywhere uh, with cruelty, they use this raping and other forms of sexual violence, but the objects changed. How to explain that? Why they are like they are? It's impossible to explain, because every one of us who's present there, uh, they, we wouldn't do what they are doing, and we are thinking about what will happen when Mariupol is liberated, other towns of Kherson uh, region, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk regions are liberated. But what this criminal is doing, 
he's uh, uh, eliminating the evidence of the crimes. Because after Bucha, when uh, all the world got horrified, they start either uh, burying these bodies into huge graves, and we see four of them, um, and they are 350 meters long. But they also have 13 crematoria. They, they are burning the um, uh, bodies. And who's doing it? Who's uh, uh, collecting these bodies? The colleague was talking about filtration camps. These are people who were not uh, sent to Russian Federation because they did not give a correct answer. They did not say that they support this Russian special operation. They said this is the war. They were taken to these filtration or concentration camps. Uh, the one like in Alenivka, in Novozovsk region of Donetsk Oblast. Uh, they have uh, more than 4,000 people there, uh, you and, and it was uh, designed for 500. And, uh, and they practically uh, don't feed them. And now they use them to collect these bodies, uh, to uh, find uh, these bodies uh, in the theater, in the maternity house, and to eliminate the evidence of the crime. And when, in the beginning, during the opening, I told that Facebook banned me, and they deleted uh, uh, what I wrote last, last week about these crimes, about this sexual violence uh, against our uh, small children, our boys, and they uh, deleted it because of norm, uh, of moral ethical norms. I am violating these norms now again, according to Facebook, but we need to know about all these crimes. All of us should know that so that we can fight for our victory, but we would like to have fewer of such victims. Alexandrovka, it was in April when orcs were there. Now a month passed, and these people tell us about uh, what was happening. And I thank uh, many resolutions of the European Parliament, of the, par uh, of the uh, uh, rights and human rights of UN. Uh, I thank them for reminding everyone about the crimes of Russian Federation and I address member countries uh, uh, requesting for all the assistance to these victims and irrespective of the national legislation of these countries to um, uh, help with abortions. And uh, I think that we have such examples in Poland, for example, because in the past, our girls, they don't want to make these abortions in our country because they uh, don't want to live after that. They, 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 they want to live after that. They want to live after that. We will win. But they go to different countries. And sometimes we would send them to Romania, to Germany, because it was impossible to do it in Poland. Now po Poland is doing it. And I thank for the support of such women. Uh, and uh, uh, everything is ahead of us. But only thanks to the world being with us next to us. Thank you. Thank you, Ludmilla. Ken. Uh, there is a special strategy of Russian soldiers of raping Ukrainian women, uh, children, uh, so it's clear evidence of sexual violence. From your international experience, how should, how we can to protect Ukrainian women, Ukrainian children, and how we can deal with trauma, what uh, all this family getting from it? Well, obviously, you know, rape, sexual assault is, is another war crime. You know, there's no question about that. Um, I think the open question now is how extensive is it in Ukraine? Um, and, you know, Human Rights Watch has received some accounts. Um, we, we have not yet ourselves established a pattern. And I think this is something that, that needs investigation. You know, it's, um, and we're, we, to be honest, we're conservative about this. You know, we don't 
use the rhetoric before we have the evidence. Um, and it's, you know, it's bad enough to say that they're you know, the kinds of war crimes that I described. You know, I, I think, frankly, there probably are also crimes against humanity in the sense that there is you know, systematic persecution of Ukrainians by virtue of their ethnicity and nationality. So there are very, very serious crimes here. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm very careful to make sure that rhetoric doesn't exceed the evidence we have, because it's, you know, it, it's, you don't need to do this kind of, you know, escalation of rhetoric. What we have proven is plenty bad enough and, and deserves, you know, huge efforts to try to stop. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Just, uh, take the oh, sorry. Um, sorry. My name is Mandy Sangera, and um, I'm an international human rights activist, and I'm currently supporting Ukraine women, and, um, Ukraine women in the UK who are claiming, uh, you know, refugee status. And there are other risks where um, people are host, and there are real issues about women being exploited, and you know, these women who are becoming refugees. And before the pandemic, before this whole crisis, um, women in Ukraine were victims of trafficking and, and abuse already. We've seen um, that um, you know, rape has been used in Bosnia and every other cry war that's gone on over the years. But I just wanted to introduce my colleague here as well, um, Tatiana, who is here from the OSCE, who's done a lot of work, and there's Leo as well. And I think there's some people who are doing a lot of work on the ground in Ukraine right now who are supporting those very women. And I think um, we need to have a joined up approach. If we could have two minutes, I would really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, thank Andy. You. My name is Tatiana Kotlarenko. I'm the advisor on anti-human trafficking issues at the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights at the OSCE. And I just actually came back from a visit in Romania where we were assessing um, the trafficking risks to women and children. Um, and not just in Romania, but all across both the transit and destination countries. And the situation is really worrying because you have women and children fleeing to situations of what they think are safety, but they face horrible risks of exploitation, especially the women actually and children who have experienced sexual violence are particularly vulnerable to further situations of sexual exploitation and other forms of ex exploitation. So that's something that we need to watch out for now, but also in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, if I could just say, I mean, sure. you're absolutely right. If, I mean, Human Rights Watch has done some reporting on this. You know, obviously the vast majority of the refugees are women and children without men. The men are, for the most part, not allowed to leave Ukraine because there's a war and they, they need it for military service. So there is an inherent vulnerability here. Now, you know, many Ukrainians have been fortunate in finding, you know, friends and family in Europe who have been willing to take them in. But, you know, a number are arriving without contacts and there is a real need to ensure that they're just not, you know, picked up by whoever picks them up, you know, some of whom are not there for humanitarian purposes. And so this is, you know, an issue that really deserves attention. Now, it is receiving some attention from, you know, the border states, but that doesn't mean the problem is solved. And I think you're absolutely right to bring this up. I see that there is one more comment from the floor. Uh, my friend Tatiana Kutlehanko, uh, who is very close to Save Ukraine, has been working with Save Ukraine for many years. And thank you, Mandy, for um, your incredible, incredible work. Uh, I am the honorary advisor to Save Ukraine, uh, Mikola Kulibas Foundation, uh, NGO. We, um, he's the former commissioner for children to the president of Ukraine um, for seven years. We operate uh, extraordinarily and our numbers talk for ourselves. We evacuate, provide emergency assistance, um, rehouse, rebuild, reunite, and we uh, provided uh, this help to more than 41,500 children and women. And this issue of trafficking is absolutely, absolutely enormous and needs to be highlighted right now. Also, we're very grateful to be here and appreciate to talk with you, Tatiana and Mandy, and you guys later. Thank you very much for your comment. So there is one more comment, please. Sorry, I'll give it back to you in a second. 
Hello, my name is Esther Dingemont. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Survivors Fund, and we uh, work with victims of conflict-related sexual violence around the world. And I was in Kiev a few weeks ago, and I would like to ask you something again about what you say about the escalation of the, the rhetoric, because um, being there, speaking a lot to victims, and we have worked with victims in Ukraine from 2014-15, uh, the victims of sexual violence at the time, we hear your testimonies, and there are so many already that are not yet documented officially, but the reports are so many already um, with La Strada, with all of the under, uh, other NGOs. And like you're saying, some women and girls are not ready yet for the proper and official documentation. So isn't there also the risk on the other side that we're too cautious by not wanting to escalate the rhetoric, but at the same time then not yet recognizing how this war crime of sexual violence is, is really used at the moment? Uh, Look, it's, it's clearly a risk. And so I, I mean, I think we're right to talk about it as a problem. I, you know, I just, Human Rights Watch doesn't use rhetoric before we have the evidence. Yeah. You know, it's just that's how we operate and frankly how we should operate. You know, so as other people collect evidence, that changes the picture. So at this stage, I think the right thing to do, at least for us, is to talk in warning terms. You know, we're not saying, you know, there are clear cases of rape. We're not saying rape is being used as a no. war strategy. We can't really prove that yet, you know. Um, it may come to that. I'm, I'm not precluding it. We just don't have that evidence yet. And that's why, I mean, I, we're just inherently conservative in this. And we, we, you know, are led by the evidence. So we should keep collecting that evidence and, and we may change the conclusion. Um, if I may add, I'm so sorry, I think this is rather important. I was in Kyiv two days ago. I was in the south of uh, Ukraine uh, only a few days ago. And I have met personally some of the victims, uh, including people with disabilities are also concerned. And this is <laughs> absolutely awful. I have met this 24-year-old year uh, mentally disabled who was raped and is pregnant. There's no question this is happening. I mean, nobody. Oh no, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I think it was important to share a personal story. Well, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, I think everybody accepts that this is a problem. What we just don't know is how systematic it has become, and that's what we're looking at. Excuse me. Yes. Людмила, я вам дякую за всю вашу роботу, яку ви робите. Це ці факти, які ви вже про які ви вже кажете дуже довго. Їх не потрібно підтверджувати, бо вони вже підтверджені. Вони вже підтверджені життям. Я живу мешкаю I live in Germany and uh, I work with refugees and what they talk about it's awful. All the time I follow your speeches that's awful. А тепер до вас запитання. This um, uh, this way to prove to prove to prove how existential it is. And uh, what do you mean, how existential it is? Uh, raped women, raped, uh, uh, raped babies, raped children. How long, how long should be? And how much time do you need just to prove it? It has been proved, it has already been proved. That's the point, and uh, that's uh, the, uh, the talk, we're just talking, 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 talking. And uh, no one knows uh, what people feel being there, being raped. Uh, couple of times uh, by many people and by uh, horrible circumstances and uh, situations. And uh, that's the point. How long should it be? How much time does it need to prove? To prove? How many evidences do you need? That's the point. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. No, as I say, I don't, I don't deny that it's happening. We're just trying to, um, you know, the issue for us is the extent of it. And that's what we're studying. You know, it, I mean, similarly with the executions, we have many examples of executions. We're trying to understand, you know, it clearly has been pervasive in the villages and towns, you know, north of, of Kyiv, um, north of Chernihiv. You know, we don't yet know what's happening in Kherson around there. We don't yet know what happened in Mariupol. So these are, you know, we don't speculate about this. We've got to kind of collect the facts. And it's frustrating, you know, as the war is going, as access is limited, it's frustrating when you don't know everything. Um, and that's, you know, that's just kind of inherent in the practice of documenting war crimes, is you've got to be led by the evidence. Uh, yeah. Do you understand? As a lawyer, I understand you, 
that uh, you need to uh, register, to have a protocol. Someone has to interrogate. I gave evidence myself uh, the time talking about these stories. The evidence were given by psychologists who ran the assistance to such uh, victims. And well, law enforcement people, they tell, and did they use uh, the, um, how did they use the teaspoon? My mandate, first of all, covers uh, the issue of helping victims. I'm taking care of victims, and I need to give the chance to a victim to live on, because I told you how many suicides, because of what happened to them, or what happened in their, uh, their eyes, and more than 200. And these are just statements about uh, sexual violence, and 80 of them were committed against minors. And all these things, uh, raping, suicide, different forms, but I understand that there should be evidence uh, for the world so that Putin and all his supporters are punished. We work now with the Deputy General Secretary of uh, the UN, Mr. Guterres, and there's a special representative of preventing sexual, vi sexual violence in conflicts. I met her, she was in Kyiv, and we agreed that on, in my office, on the basis of my office and offices in the regions, there will be special psychologist lawyers trained, and the platforms will be created so that uh, the victims could provide evidence once to professionals. You know, sometimes when they collect evidence from minors, we need green rooms and to uh, organize such information campaign so that the victim understand that it's safe for the victim. To give evidence means to survive through the tragedy that they had already survived through. Are they ready to do that? Now we have just very few people like that who are ready. But first, the person should continue living with this burden, with this tragedy. And I thank to all the countries who receive such women, and there are many of them in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Germany. They provide such psychological help to them there. And I believe that's more important now than uh, uh, making the protocols uh, of the minutes of inter Olivia approaching to closing remark. And my last question would be for both of you. What could we do all together to reduce of num number of war victims in general and especially of Ukraine? And Lyudmila, special question to you. What, what can do everyone from us, each country, international community to help Ukraine to stop this war? First of all, uh, people should know about that. We need to inform the society. We need to talk to the neighbors, to tell to the neighbor about that so that everyone knows, so that they uh, push their governments, their parliaments who make decisions as to strengthening sanctions against the Russian Federation, strengthening personal sanctions against those who are uh, issuing such orders. That's their tactic, that's their weapon. And the next thing, when people say that the world that, that the peace could be achieved without weapons. Uh, weapons is like continuation of war. Weapons is uh, helping us get victory. And that is why we need the offensive weapons. And a lot of uh, things. Uh, how the second army of the world differs from us. They differ only in numbers, and we need to reduce their numbers. And that could be done only with weapons. And I would appreciate if every one of you makes a step in this way. Please tell others, and please uh, uh, 
press your uh, authorities, your governments. Only together we can uh, defeat this enemy who's called. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree that um, the, the international pressure has been absolutely critical. Um, but let me make a different point. I think that the pressure that Putin is most sensitive to, and you know, we all recognize this is Putin's war. It would, never would have happened without Putin himself deciding. But the pressure he is most sensitive to is the pressure from the Russian people. You know, Putin is terrified of a color revolution. He is terrified of, of an uprising. And so I know that there's a tendency in Ukraine to feel like, you know, all, all Russians are the enemy. That's a mistake. Um, there have been, you know, despite the censorship, despite the disinformation, you know, despite the threatened 15-year prison terms for anybody who opposes Putin, there have been anti-war protests in 150 cities across Russia. And it's important to treat the Russian people, at least elements of them, as potential allies. You know, Human Rights Watch has been making every effort that everything we publish, we put, we translate into Russian, and we try to get it into Russia, you know, through Telegram, through YouTube, through VPNs, because, you know, and in fact, 10% of the Russian people have now downloaded VPNs. You know, there is um, this thirst for true information, you know, thirst to get beyond the Kremlin's disinformation and censorship. And, and I think it's important to remember this. I, I, you know, I've had, I should say, somewhat disturbing conversations with certain Ukrainian officials who say every Russian is guilty. You know, every Russian backs this. You know, every Russian thinks that Crimea is part of Russia and therefore they're all guilty. That's a mistake. You know, I think we have to look at the Russian people as, in a sense, victims of Putin himself. You know, yes, some Russians back the war, I'm sure. But, you know, enough of them don't want these atrocities committed in their name, and we need to keep speaking to them and informing them because I think that their internal pressure within Russia is going to be absolutely essential in trying to curtail the atrocities and end the war. And Ludmila, can thank you for being today with us and thank you for sharing your insight. Thank you. Поэтому даже не капельки сожаления.